Welcome back, Noble Warriors, to Weapons Month 5. I'm the Green Scorpion, and last week, you all survived my Psychic Assault. And in RPG rules, this would mean that it's your turn to attack. But lucky for me, I've got the perfect form of defense. The Shield. Simple, elegant, sometimes not so elegant. It can be made of anything and comes in a variety of shapes and sizes, from wrist-mounted bucklers to human height towers. Often paired with a one-handed melee weapon, shields accompany the loadout of some of the greatest fantasy heroes. This might allow the character to block attacks, deflect projectiles, there might even be a shield bash move. But for many, the shield is simply an accessory, the sidekick to the sword or a lance. But for today, we want to shine a light on fighters whose movesets revolve around these adamant artifacts. They might even use it as their only weapon, your Captain Americas and your Steven Universes. Some say the best offense is a good defense, some say the best defense is a good offense, but these 10 champions don't have to choose. We'll be looking at creative uses of the weapons, but expect a few old standbys to crop up. Using spikes or sharp edges to gore enemies, throwing the shield and bouncing it back with impossible physics, or the classic charging star just to steamroll your way through. That's Imaginary Shield Fighting 101, but you'll see people get far more inventive than that. And so, obligatory flame shield joke for if you don't like my picks, let's buckle down. These are the top 10 video game shield wielders. A tale of souls, swords, and shields eternally retold. I'm gonna go all out! At one point, I thought everyone on this list would exclusively use shields, like General Tsao from Sly 3 or Kadira from Indivisible. But there is a class of fighter for whom, though they use another weapon to strike, the shield really stands out. Characters like Dark Souls Looking Glass Knight, or Link. Fortunately, Link did not crack my top 10, so I get to live another day. Got that reference out of the way, let's move on to another Sword and Shield blondie. Cassandra Alexandra made her debut in Soul Calibur 2, meant mainly to replace series mainstay Sophitia, who was unavailable for plot reasons. Sophitia had fought with a short sword and shield, so Cassandra took over that Athenian style. But Sophitia was added back for the home console version of Soul Calibur 2, and the sisters essentially became echo fighters of one another. Cassandra struggled to differentiate herself in future installments, such as Soul Calibur 4, where her moveset now heavily features her butt. But after taking Soul Calibur 5 to rethink her life choices, Cassandra returned for Soul Calibur 6's DLC as more than just a clone. The idea being that she would still use the same weapons, but with a heavier focus on the shield, whereas Sophitia favored the sword. You'd think that this would make Cassandra more defensive, but it's actually the opposite. That saucer is now just another blunt instrument that Cassandra can use to start combos. This leaves her exposed more often than not, but it also lends itself to a much more aggressive playstyle. It's also worth noting that Cassandra's weapons are blessed by Hephaestus, Greek god of the forge. This used to mean that her weapons were just unbreakable, but now they come imbued with lightning. Cassandra also gets a shield throw, which returns to her for no apparent reason, electromagnetism I guess, and her super combo turns this into a game of air hockey, with her enemy as a heavily bruised goalie. While she's easily the more headstrong and less reverent of the sisters, known for cursing her own patron deity, Cassandra still embodies the shield in her brass yet protective nature. Her reason for setting out was to take up Sophitia's task for her, and when Sophitia returned to the fray, Cassandra accepted a supportive role in her quest. She even hoped timelines would prevent her niece and nephew's fates in Soul Calibur V. Decanonizing that game is about as heroic as it gets. Cassandra has always been the Aegis for her family, even if she goes about it in her own heavy-handed way. I'll show you. Force Fields, the Shields of the Future. In the 22nd century, I don't want to still be carrying around a big bulky bulwark. Give me a device that can project some sort of plasma to separate me from a hail of bullets coming my way. Then maybe I can put Link on any list I want. And for the record, yes I know I brought that on myself, shut up. This is the core strategy of the enigmatic Shadow Broker. While other space criminals in the Mass Effect Milky Way deal in arms, drugs, or armed drugs, the Shadow Broker makes his living off the sale of information collecting secrets from all the top powers in the universe and selling them to the highest bidder, making sure no side ever gets too much of an advantage so that he can continue profiteering from the resulting conflict. There are many layers of security at play here, most importantly, his anonymity. Only his top agents actually know where the broker is, and even they don't know who or what he is. Past that, he has an army of enforcers. 
but when you finally get to him in Mass Effect 2's DLC, he's... Oh, dear lord, he's a big boy! Aside from his massive physique and trusty blaster, he's prepared with a personal force field around his body, as well as a more traditional laser shield. It's transparent like a riot shield, so he can observe your puzzled look as you try to figure out how you're going to even hurt this guy. It even repels biotic attacks, so you can't psychic him to death either. Long range won't work since, even when his reflective field is down, he'll just hide behind his crimson light shield and return fire. And if you try fighting him in medium range, he'll go full rhino on you and slam you into a sandwich using the wall and the shield as bread. You're basically forced to fight close range, a terrifying prospect when you remember how yoked this guy is. Broker is a member of the Yogg, a pre-spaceflight alien race that have been blacklisted by the rest of the galaxy after they brutally massacred the first diplomats to visit them. He takes out one of your party members in a single blow, and manages to hold his own against Liara to Sony, our amazing psychic space cell from last week, as well as the galaxy's greatest million dollar cyborg zombie commander Shepard at the same time. And even then he was more than a match for them, since they had to resort to short-circuiting his tech to cause a concentrated explosion in order to kill him. If that's what it takes to bring you down, you have a pretty good operation going. Forget Shadow Broker, more like Shepard Breaker. We've recently seen a rise in Pokemon taking up arms. Sir Fetched has a lance, Inteleon has a rifle, and multiple Pokemon come with their own shields. Sableye was our first choice with his giant gem, but that's only in the mega form, a bit too situational. Aegislash carries a shield, and for bonus points, is a sword. But I think we need to honor the shield Pokemon of Pokemon Shield, the legendary pupper Samacenta. Along with Zacian, these ancient heroes of Galar take arming Pokemon to a literal extreme. As in, you actually give them a weapon to hold, and they use that weapon. You don't actually see that too often. On his own, Samacenta is a majestic fighting type doggo, but hand over the rusted shield and Samacenta will restore to its former glory, the crown shield, and integrate it right into its own beautiful mane. And I know most people prefer Zacian over Samacenta, myself included. I mean, it's Great Grey Wolf Sith. But that's the thing. It's Great Grey Wolf Sith. Or Rapide. Koromaru. I've seen this kind of thing before. But a giant canine wearing a sacred Eskachin like a bib? This? Yeah, this is a new one. You could say it's more like armor, akin to the medieval practice of barding cavalry, but the front plate is able to shift forward in a way that retains that quality of the original weapon, despite looking like a face insert photo op at a carnival. Combat-wise, Samacenta's glow-up does it a lot of favors. With the new added steel type, Samacenta keeps the same number of three weaknesses, but goes from three resistances to eight. Two of them being times four advantages, plus an immunity to poison. So already it's doing wonders. Then you have the Dauntless Shield ability, raising its already impressive defense stat by one stage. Its special defense isn't half bad either, and with a decent attack for a legendary, it can take advantage of a number of hard-hitting moves like close combat. Or if it already knows Iron Head, the hold item will upgrade it into Behemoth Bash, a mighty blow that doubles in power against Dynamaxed enemies, making it an effective Godzilla killer. And if Zama sent a new King Shield, I probably would have ranked it 5 spots higher. I know that's Aegislash's signature move, but Aegislash and Zacian both learned Sacred Sword, and that used to be the Unova Musketeer's signature move. Come on, Samazenta is literally using a King's Shield. The shield that belonged to the King. Why are you playing favorites, Game Freak? Zenta's a good boy too. Alright, let me just check my watch here, and... Yep! Rhyme time, baby! Xenoblade Chronicles may be a single-player game, but its combat is reminiscent of MMORPGs. In that spirit, Rhyme is the ultimate tank, lugging around his signature weapon, the Gun Lance. It's called that, but really, it's neither a gun nor a lance. More of a giant iron slab with a built-in box cutter. Standard issue in the Cullinan 9 Guard, apparently, though I can't see any of these NPCs doing what Ryan does. And Ryan was never all that committed to that job anyway. At least, not as committed as he is to his best buddy, Shulk. Little guy wants to go on a revenge quest across the known world, and Ryan's like, Yeah man, I'll just drop everything. Road trip! Ryan and Shulk's bromance translates right into their team's synergy, thanks to Ryan's many abilities that draw aggro. 
While he's taunting, Shulk can get bonus damage with his backslash. And if Shulk can inflict break on a target, Ryan can follow up with Wild Down to topple them, keeping them from attacking for a moment. While he is specially suited to help Shulk, Ryan's a great tank for any composition. Just maybe include a healer in there because Ryan's gonna be withstanding a lot of damage. But with auras to lower enemy damage, rage to deal back spike damage, anchor chain to hold onto aggro, shield bash to daze the foes he's already toppled, guard shift to block every attack at the cost of his own movement, and last stand to recover from a fatal blow, not to mention a slew of crowd control abilities, Ryan can hold the line and snuff the competition like a bunch of jokers. This is not a man. This is a fortress with legs. When Yacht Club Games first started developing Shovel Knight, they had a character in mind simply named Beloved, who would serve as the hero's love interest. The gallant gardener would battle the Enchantress to defeat her, only to find his Beloved was the Enchantress, her body possessed by evil, and the knight would be forced to bury his Beloved with his own shovel. Pretty morbid, but Yacht Club Games soon decided that rather than a dainty damsel in distress, they wanted a woman who was Shovel Knight's equal. And so, Shield Knight was born. She's still a straight up damsel, but at least it's implied that she was pretty cool beforehand. Sporting a pair of asymmetrical shields, one body size and one travel size, Shield Knight's design has more thought put into it than I first surmised. You know how Plague Knight is a Plague Doctor, a historical figure that has become better known in recent years with all the COVID memes, but at the same time was a pretty unique cultural basis for a character? Similarly, Shield Knight is inspired by the Skjaldmir, or Shield Maidens, the term used for female Viking warriors. They didn't exclusively use shields, that's just what they were called, and Shield Knight takes the term a bit more literally. Actually, there's some debate between archaeologists if the Shield Maidens really existed, but they certainly appear in mythologies, such as the Brynhildir and the Volsung Sagas. These tales would often interchange the heroines to either be Shield Maidens or Valkyries, lady riders of Asgard who chose what warriors would ascend to Valhalla, and that's why Shield Knight has these wings on her helmet. She's a Valkyrie, and that's awesome. That said, Plague Knight, Spectre Knight, and King Knight were great choices for the DLC adventures, but I always wanted a Shield Knight story. Maybe a sequel, and her sub-weapons could have incorporated more of that Norse influence. But let's look at what is, rather than what could have been. Though she's AWOL for most of the original journey, she helps her Shovel Bay in the final battle against the released entity of the Enchantress, blocking attacks that otherwise would have been unavoidable, and using the flat on her shield as a platform for Shovel Knight to use to reach his target. She also appears as a flashback boss in Spectre of Torment, an awesome moment that's slightly sullied by how easy it turns out to be. Alas, Shield Knight, your greatness just wasn't meant to see the light of day until the King of Cards DLC, where Yacht Club just casually added a Smash Bros style battle mode, Shovel Knight Showdown. Shield Knight might be my favorite character in this side attraction. The big shield blocks everything, she can charge to safely close distances, she can throw out the disc and leave it there indefinitely until she's ready to call it back to her, and though you'd think this would make her vulnerable, remember she still has that sidearm to perform the buckler blow, which is basically her version of the dust knuckle. There's still a well of hidden potential here just waiting to be unearthed, but after all the digging that's happened since the game's original release, we can finally see that little glint. And it is stunning. Magic and Shields. An odd matchup, but one that works quite well. In games like Dungeons & Dragons, shields are generally too heavy for wizards to hold while spellcasting, but in other systems, they might be a valuable way to cover your squishy body while performing incantations. The shield might even make a good canvas for runes. Many will bring up Vexen from Kingdom Hearts, who takes forever to kill with his constant ice spells and floating blue blockade. But Vexen leans a bit too heavily towards the magic side for me. Kind of falls flat as an actual shield fighter. Well, maybe if he did anything worthwhile in Kingdom Hearts 3, I'd feel differently. It's okay, Vex, you still got top 10 cryomancers, and no one will ever be able to take that away from you. But for a more kinetic form of shield casting, look no further than Samurai Showdown. Hailing from China, we have Wu Rihian, and she brought a shield to a sword fight. This metal bowl serves as the conduit for many elemental spells, and for an interesting reason. Wu Rihian is a master of feng shui. Wait, that thing where you rearrange your furniture in a certain way for a happier life? 
Well, that may be our modern take on it, but feng shui goes back centuries as a form of Chinese spiritualism, a practitioner becoming one with the environment by balancing the elements around them. The term feng shui literally translates to water wind, and involves controlling your surroundings by a metaphysical standard as described on, well, this symbol right here. That's not just a weapon Wu's holding, it's a feng shui compass, and with it she can shift around the elements to her liking. She doesn't even look like she's actively fighting most of the time, she's either vibing or actively avoiding combat. But as a result, she sets traps of growing roots. She can call upon lightning, cause fiery explosions, or shoot chunks of ice. And if the setting is just right, she uses her compass to summon a divine dragon. Who decides this room would look a lot better if her opponent weren't in it? I am in love with this concept. A quirky zoner with the ancient Buddhist power of nope. I don't even mind that she's, well, tragically low tier. And I don't think she minds it either, just so long as she can survive her Japanese vacation. I do hope they bring her back in future installments. Fighting games tend to introduce newbies like this and then forget about them in the sequels in favor of old standards. You know, Hakan from Street Fighter 4, Zvi in Soul Calibur 5. Creative concepts that just need a bit more balancing. Well, Wu Rihyang is all about balance. Come on, just give her a charging star and she'll be top tier in no time. I've never seen Shield Knight or Rhine summon a dragon out of their shields. Come on, get on Wu's level. <laughs> Speaking of ancient China, as we've mentioned in previous countdowns, the Dynasty Warriors series is a retelling of the novel Romance of the Three Kingdoms, which in turn is a retelling of about 100 years of Chinese military history. And in all three, we find the indomitable Cao Ren. And that's pronounced Cao Ren, not Cao Ren. In history, Cao Ren is a major badass serving in the Eastern Han Dynasty under his second cousin Cao Cao. Over his tumultuous career as a general, Cao Ren proved himself to be especially dangerous in defensive battles, keeping high the morale of his men, holding off sieges far longer than could be humanly expected, winning counterattacks against outnumbering invaders, and even charging outside of his walls to personally defend smaller battalions. He eventually retired with the title of Grand Marshal, which is just about the highest honor available. It's a bit of a crime that he's hardly mentioned in the novel, but Dynasty Warriors 4 represents him with dignity as a well-armored sage and man of the people, Cao Cao's backbone and moral compass. In Warriors 4 and 5, Cao Ren brandishes his famous shield, as well as a double-bladed spike that he can swing around like a short sword. This might look like he's dual-wielding, but I'd consider them two halves of the same weapon, the spike able to slide right into the face of the shield and protrude out the side. This allows Cao Ren to fight with versatility keeping the droves of enemy soldiers at arm's length, or thwart close-up attacks if his shield armor is occupied. He can even launch the blade from his shield like a harpoon gun, only for it to reload into the shield because video games. And on horseback, the blade extends even farther out for maximum distance. Not a fan of unnecessary bloodshed, Ren often tries to disable foes with the same swing he uses to parry their blows, knocking them prone for a good nap. Unfortunately, both Ren's fighting style and character take a hit in the subsequent games. Warrior 6 swaps out his shield for a double-sided trident, and 7 gives him a clumsy old flail. That's just wrong. Even when his shield is returned to him in 8, his contribution to the Wei army is more tell than show. Seriously, this is a grand marshal here, show some respect. Ah oh well, underwhelming sequels can't take away the memories of good times. I know all Dynasty Warriors characters can solo the population of New Jersey, nothing special. It's like, what the fuck is this? Who does this shit? But given the history, tactics, and aplomb of Cao Ren, I think he wears it better than most. Whether you pronounce it Cao or Cao, this man is a beast, no matter how you slice it. I... Uh, what? Yep. That's right, you're getting a small bonus entry today because, well, I messed up. The script was done, like done done, recorded. I announced this video's release in three days, wham bam, thank you ma'am. Then to relax, I decided to watch some old fighting game videos and how the hell did I forget about roast beef strudelberg, I mean Rizbif Stridberg, the awesome Swedish vampire hunter from Melty Blood fighting with a holy shield called Gamaliel that she can disguise as a cello. I am so mad at myself for forgetting this one. 
Gamaliel has a giant spike running through it, similar to how Sao Ren uses his shield, giving Reese Biff an oppressive amount of reach. She can even channel her spirit through that spike to fire a bullet capable of felling the darkest creatures of the night, or impale her opponents and launch them across a screen. Reese Biff missed the ranking not because she doesn't deserve it, not because of any rule or caveat, but because I realized my oversight too late and there's not enough time to change the whole script around. So, what do I do? Well, if I hadn't forgotten, she would probably rank just above Sao Ren for me. I mean, they have pretty similar movesets, except Reese Biff has a bit of an edge due to her ability to perform awesome shield combos in a fighting game. But then everyone else would get knocked down a rank, which seems unfair to Cassandra at number 10. So you know what? I'm giving Reese Biff the honorary 3.5 spot. And let me just say that I am deeply sorry, Lady Stridberg. As a woman of the church, I hope you'll forgive me. Normally, I'm hesitant to put a character too high on these lists if they use a variety of weapons besides the main one. But there's room for exceptions, especially if we're talking about Hades, the best thing to happen in 2020. I fell in love so hard with this game, I suspect Aphrodite might be involved. Our hero Zagreus, unliving demigod and son of the titular Hades, switches between six main weapon types in his many, many attempts to escape the underworld. And he's incredibly proficient with all of them. Spears, swords, goddamn railguns, total expert. But at least he's restricted to one per run, so his mastery with each infernal arm is a pillar unto itself. Translation? If he only had his shield, Zagreus would do just fine. Wielding Aegis, the same shield forged by Chaos and once used by Zeus to fight the Titans, Zagreus turns an immovable object into an unstoppable force. Shield punch? Check. This swing actually deals a good bit of knockback so you can pin small enemies to the walls until their health depletes. Charging Star? Check. He can block as many projectiles and attacks as he wants until he's ready to crash into and through his enemies. Shield throw? That's a Texas sized check right there. Bouncing it like a chakram off of multiple targets. It does mean that you have to wait for it to return before you can attack again, but Zag's spry dashes are usually enough to keep him safe in the meantime. And if that were all there was to it, Prince Zed would have easily made the top 10. But then there's the plethora of ways to upgrade Aegis on any given Hell Tour. Daedalus enhancements can increase the number of bounces on the shield throw or provide stronger charging options. And like any of the other weapons, Aegis's attack and special can be blessed by whatever random assortment of gods decide to help Z-Man today. From Dionysus's concussive hangovers to Demeter's wintry slowdowns. Also worth noting that Athena mostly grants shield-like boons that deflect projectiles, whether you have Aegis equipped or not, so you can technically shield without your shield, or have more shield per shield with your shield equipped. Finally, there's the various aspects unlocked in the late game. The Infernal Arms are known to transform when they appear to different heroes throughout history, but with some Titan's blood, the Prince can revert Aegis to the form it took for Zeus, giving it a crazy AoE tornado when thrown, or he could take the OG aspect of Chaos that multiplies the shields into multiple discs when thrown. Then there's the fourth aspect that gives the shield a form it will have in the future for a certain Beowulf. With this large charge, you can load your magic bloodstones in it to give more magical properties to the charge attack. This is probably the single most variable shield on this list. And I think we can justify this even if Aegis isn't Zagreus' only weapon. Because I don't think any one of the Infernal Arms stands out as his main tool. Much of the game depicts Zagreus with his sword, as it's the first weapon you have unlocked, but in-game there's no special emphasis put on the blade. Personally, Aegis is my favorite weapon to use, having a measure for every situation. I'll still switch it up from time to time to get those darkness bonuses, and variety is the spice of life, but the underworld is plenty spicy already, and Aegis is a spice of success. <laughs> I'm not as limber as I used to be, while well, you... I cannot remain. People have been asking me to include characters from Smite for a long time. I haven't played a whole lot of it, but fans can finally rejoice. Their prayers have been answered by Kabra Khan, Mayan god of the mountains. Maybe not the god you'd normally pray to for this sort of thing, but hey, I was looking through the wiki and when I saw this guy with two tower shields, it definitely piqued my interest. In myth, Kabra Khan and his brother Zipakna were the sons of the hell god Vukukaki 
and they basically function like the Titans in Greek myth or the Jotuns in Norse. Enormous, boastful giants, Zipakna would build mountains and Kabar Khan would break them down. And their wanton destruction was enough for the main pantheon to put out a hit, sending the hero twins to kill him by offering poison food. I guess when your target smashes mountains for a living, you have to resort to some cheap tactics. Kabar Khan's back in smite to show that he won't stand for such foul play. Kabar Khan falls under the vague umbrella of support gods, with an aura that reduces damage to nearby allies, but other than that, Kabar Khan mostly supports by disrupting opponents and being a really hard man to kill. If there's no one around for him to support, well, he'll do just fine by himself, thank you very much. With Refraction Shield, Kabar Khan's shields gain protection stacks while they take damage, and he can burn those stacks to stun enemies with a massive metal clap. He can also enrage himself to move faster, ignore slows and roots, and deal even more stuns. And he can drum those shields on the ground to create tremors, dealing steady damage in a large area and slowing enemies trying to escape. This is often done in big team fights to add DPS to your side, but it also makes a great farming tool, or an execution move if combined with his ultimate. When using Tectonic Shift, five stalagmites erupt from the earth in an arc formation, blocking entry or escape. So, essentially, Kabar Khan can use his metal shields to create a much larger stone shield, which can either protect his team from damage, or more often, box his opponents in and subject them to more tremors. Gotta love watching your enemies squirm as they try to decide whether it'd be better to try and break through the wall or double back and risk moving closer to you. I love a good support, but honestly, throw that strat out the window. Kabar Khan makes a good early game lane bully if you build damage. The strategy falls off by level 7 if you haven't spent your kill gold wisely, but by that point you've effectively shielded your team against failure. Kabar Khan's kit is all about halting the enemy, encouraging Kabar Khan to take attacks so that he can return them twofold, all with two tower shields. I'm sorry, I'm always going to be excited when a weapon master uses two of something. Hey Ryan, you know that full body ton of steel you lug around? Could you maybe try and carry two of those? No? Eh, that's okay. After all, we can't all be mountain gods. I'll admit, sometimes my number one spots are too easy to guess. If you know much about League of Legends, you know that there's this big shield guy. And you know that I absolutely had to talk about him somewhere on this list. And now some of you are grumbling because obviously this is the only spot left. Well hey, I haven't had a lead character on my list since Cyborgs. I think I've gotten pretty good at not leaning on it too much for ideas. So, stiff upper lip. Let's talk about Brom, the heart of the Freljord. To friends, I am Snowfall. To enemies, I am Avalanche. Brom was added to the game in 2014, and they went hard on his lore. Hailing from the Freljord, Runeterra's merciless tribal tundra, Brom's backstory is that of a folk hero like Paul Bunyan, pulling trees from the ground to make bridges and chopping wood with his bare hands. The kinds of feats that, even in universe, are probably exaggerated. However, his greatest tale is how he got his famous Ramhorn shield. It was actually a door to a vault, enchanted by Orn to be unbreakable and impassable from the outside. But Brom heard the cries of a troll child who had snuck into the vault another way and was now trapped. Even Brom's manly muscles couldn't penetrate the front entrance, so he took the natural next step, punching his way through the freaking mountain. Once inside, he was able to help the troll out and open the door from the inside, but his punching had disrupted the snow on the mountainside. Thinking quickly, Brom pulled the door off of its hinges, and with his strength to hold it and the door's protective enchantment, Brom was able to save the village from an avalanche, and he's been lugging this gargantuan gateway with him ever since. True to his past as a savior of the little guy, Brom plays as a support, specializing in crowd control and keeping his teammates alive. His basic attacks proc a concussive blows counter. After four hits, a target will be briefly stunned, though importantly, only the first of those hits has to come from Brom. If he goes out bopping every enemy on the head, faster firing allies can build the rest of the counters to stun their targets, so Brom and a good ranger can slow down a whole armada. With Winter's Bite, Brom can use the shield's defenses to shoot out an icy blast that also applies towards concussive blows. Stand Behind Me quickly maneuvers Brom between his friend and the worst nearby aggressor, even if it means hopping through terrain. 
This synergizes beautifully with Unbreakable, activating the door's You Shall Not Pass button to create a force field that reduces directional damage and completely negates the first projectile. This is huge. Ash Arrows, Draven Axes, Yasuo Tornadoes, Missiles, Lasers, Yellow Cards, your enemy's ace in the hole utterly cancelled by Brahm's E. Finally, there's Brahm's ultimate Glacial Fissure, a big AoE knockup that breaks the very ground he stands on by slamming his shield into it, without even so much as a scratch befalling that ram's head. If we stack Brahm's move list next to Cabracans from Smite, You'll see a lot of these same disruption moves, and for the purposes of this list, I do like Cabracan's ultimate a little more. It has a grander effect in manipulating the field to box in enemies. But brahm has got that stand behind me slash unbreakable combo that wins it out for me. Apples and oranges I know, but let me put it to you this way. In my past videos, I sometimes penalize League characters who were supports, such as Janna, Nami, and Taric on their respective elements countdowns. On those lists, I just felt it important to be more offensive with your elements. Brahm is definitely a more defensive character than Copper Khan, less able to take out opponents mano a mano. But this is shield wielders, right? Defensive is kind of the point, and besides his passive aura, Copper Khan's not really watching out for his team. Neither character has that Captain America shield throw, but when you consider the most basic purpose of a shield, to block an attack, can anyone really top Brahm's unbreakable move? I don't think they can. Since Brahm was added, he's been a constant presence in Riot's animated trailers and adverts, fighting off evil hordes to outrun and then stop an avalanche in its tracks. This is because this active support encapsulates one of the best aspects of playing a team game. The big goddamn hero moment. When Ryan builds up enough aggro to distract an enemy just before it can finish off Shulker Fiora, that feels amazing. But when Brom leaps across lane to shelter his team from a misfortune bullet spray, that is downright heroic. And you see Brom doing this all over his appearances. Go back to his initial reveal. <laughs> Next time you get my back. That is everything about Brom condensed into a single moment. Pure, unadulterated teamwork. And sure, he relies on his team to do damage while he's preventing all harm, but catch him in a dark alley and he'll show you that he's perfectly capable of punching your lights out solo. I can't stress this enough. He can negate most champions' ultimate techniques with his non-ultimate technique. Also, the shield works great as a sled. That's an instant 10 coolness points right there. Brom is the shield wielder character perfected, and if you don't agree with me, here's the door. I'm the Green Scorpion, and thank you for watching week 2 of Weapons Month 5. Next time, all systems go.